Martin and a warm welcome to everyone to my thesis presentation. In the last couple of years, I've worked on model based control of three phase dual active bridge converters for a dynamic operation and adaptive compensation of parameter deviations. And uh, I would like to start with a brief motivation, giving it some more broader context on the role of DC to DC converters in general in the power supply system. Uh, in fact, uh, many applications from both uh, stationary and mobile fields um, make use of DC to DC converters for power control and frequency decoupling purposes. And um, all of these uh, applications obviously bring along their own requirements on the design of the power electronic component. Um, however, there are a few key requirements that are becoming more and more important in the evolving uh, power supply system. Uh, that I would like to pinpoint uh, here, uh, namely a high power density for economic reasons, galvanic isolation for safety purposes, and uh, the ability to manage bidirectional power flow. As it turns out, uh, the three-phase dual active bridge converter features all of these criteria and also uh, stands out with an extraordinarily high dynamic behavior, which makes it a quite versatile uh, converter topology and uh, a good candidate for many applications in theory. In the field, uh, however, it is not very prevalent yet. So we might ask ourselves the question, uh, what is keeping the DAB3 from being more widely adopted? And uh, effectively, there are a few significant uh, implementation barriers. Uh, for example, uh, simply speaking, many attractive use cases may still be pending since they are related to emerging technologies and uh, the power supply system in evolution. And uh, this topology features a high number of uh, semiconductor switches. So uh, if we are easier on the requirements, we might have alternatives uh, which are less uh, costy, for example. Uh, another um, implementation barrier is the uh, complexity with respect to modeling and control. Uh, which is due to these um, two uh, active bridges on either side of the uh, medium frequency transformer, which makes the um, mathematical uh, uh, description a challenging task. And this challenge is even uh, increased uh, if we address um, or if we uh, take into account uh, the manufacturing tolerances, especially with respect to the magnetic uh, materials uh, which may lead to parameter deviations and phase asymmetries. This leads me to my thesis objectives. I uh, set myself the goal to lower the bar on the implementation of uh, DAB3 converters by control engineering means. And therefore I developed a general purpose control framework which uh, can be used in a plug and play manner uh, for arbitrary applications where this topology may uh, come into uh, uh, account or may come uh, handy. Uh, therefore, I needed to unlock the full dynamic potential of the DAB3 converter because um, uh, derating is always easy, but uh, if we want to meet any conceivable control requirements, uh, then of course we need the full dynamic uh, potential. Um, in order to reach these goals, I organized my dissertation into three major steps. Uh, first, I derived an accurate discrete time model of the DAB3. Uh, which I then used in a second step to develop an optimized linear control strategy. Uh, and in a, a th third step, um, I addressed the problem of leakage inductance scattering uh, as a result of um, leakage uh, of uh, manufacturing tolerances. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't be able to talk about all of these aspects, of course, so I picked out a few of them, uh, which I would like to guide you through in the next couple of minutes. Before diving into the uh, core topics of the dissertation, I would like to revisit some fundamental operating principles of the DAB3. Uh, then afterwards, we will sequentially um, discuss the discrete time modeling, the linear control synthesis, and the adaptive compensation of parameter deviations. In the end, I will uh, obviously conclude with a summary and an outlook. So let's start with uh, some fundamental operating principles about the DAB3. Um, we see the topology um, depicted here with these two active uh, three-phase bridges on either side of the medium frequency transformer. And at the terminals, uh, you can see the uh, DC link capacitors. If we want to describe the electrical behavior of this uh, topology, we can simplify it uh, as follows uh, so that we are only left uh, with um, the leakage inductance and the winding resistance for each phase. And um, 
uh, if we now want to uh, operate this topology, um, we can use this uh, single phase shift modulation that I assumed in my dissertation, where each of these bridges is operated in block mode. That means that the duty cycle is fixed at uh, 50%, and we have an interleaved phase operation uh, with uh, phase legs, where the phase legs are shifted by 120 degrees in the switching instance. Um, to transfer power, we simply need to uh, shift uh, the uh, switching instance between the primary and secondary uh, side bridges uh, by the load angle phi, or in normalized terms. We will see that later on many times. Um, I, I called it uh, D, normalized to the full electrical period. And if we uh, uh, introduce this load angle, then uh, we have uh, a, a voltage difference across the leakage inductance of each phase, which um, induces the current. So how does this look like in the, uh, the individual waveforms? Uh, here you can see the, um, uh, the, the voltages at the terminals of uh, the primary phase, uh, uh, of, the, of the first phase, uh, as an example. Uh, in dark blue, the primary side uh, terminal voltage on this side and in uh, light blue, the secondary side voltage, both in the characteristic um, six-step waveform. And as you can see, uh, we have a phase shift between these two um, uh, waveforms so that uh, the nearly sinusoidal current uh, can flow in a piecewise linear manner. And uh, below in the very bottom, uh, you see the, um, uh, the, the rectified currents on the... Um, primary side shown in gray and the, um, on the secondary side shown in black here. Um, now, obviously we have two more, more phases. So uh, just to have the full picture, um, I, I showed them here as well with this uh, phase uh, uh, shift of uh, 120 degrees. Uh, not the, yeah. Um, now, uh, the power that we uh, transfer by this means is, uh, can be described by the steady state power equation as shown here. Uh, I uh, have only uh, shown it here for uh, load angles below 60 degrees or in normalized terms below one sixth uh, because uh, any load angles uh, above uh, these uh, 60 degrees would lead to more reactive power and therefore more uh, uh, or an efficiency drop. So I concentrated on this uh, more efficient uh, operating range. So far, we have only discussed the steady state behavior. Um, in transient operation, uh, there's, uh, there are some, some interesting points as well. Uh, if you change from an initial uh, load step uh, phi one abruptly to a target load step phi two, and we actually see a very undesired be uh, behavior um, like uh, here in the DC currents or in the AC currents, we have a, a, a large overshoot and oscillations and um, a different kind of visualizing. This is in the alpha beta plane. If we apply the Clark transformation to these three phase uh, currents, then we get this um, uh, characteristic hexagonal uh, current trajectory where we start in this initial trajectory and then uh, want to move to this target trajectory. However, the abrupt step um, leads away this uh, center of uh, the hexagon uh, away from the origin uh, and hence uh, uh, a, a DC bias is actually introduced. So um, how can we avoid this? Uh, luckily, a colleague from this institute introduced a, few, a couple of years ago uh, a control approach that allowed for smooth uh, transitions uh, within half a switching period. Uh, this uh, method is called instantaneous current control. And as we can see here, um, he introduced uh, three intermediate uh, sections to reach uh, the target trajectory uh, directly. Um, in the uh, time domain, we can see that the oscillations are effectively uh, eliminated. So this allows a smooth um, operating point change. Uh, in the past couple of years, uh, some uh, improvements of this method have, has, have been uh, introduced, namely the improved instantaneous current control, opening it up uh, for arbitrary uh, winding resistances, uh, and later on um, a, a similar problem on the flux trajectory has been solved by the instantaneous flux and current control. 
and the most recent uh, improvement, uh, which is the improved IFCC, um, opened up this flux uh, uh, control also for arbitrary winding resistances once again. So this IIFCC method is used uh, throughout this thesis, um, therefore uh, might be handy to remember this. Um, so now let's uh, move on uh, to the discrete time modeling part. Um, I made use of a six-step modeling procedure, starting with a physical model definition, uh, which pretty much consists in uh, defining closed analytical formulations of the, uh, the differential equations to describe the physical uh, behavior of the converter. Then this set of equations uh, could be transformed to the Laplace domain uh, in order to uh, solve them for the state variables. Uh, in a third step, I introduced a latch to the manipulated input variables that reflects the digital nature of the microcontroller. And in a fourth step, uh, these, um, yeah, uh, uh, these, these uh, changed um, or, or these latched um, uh, equations could be uh, transformed back to the time domain in order to uh, obtain the continuous time step responses uh, with respect to all these uh, uh, state variables. Uh, and in a fifth step, we could then uh, sample uh, these continuous time step responses uh, in order to derive the, uh, the cross-coupled discrete time models from the difference equations. Since I didn't use the same sampling time in the modeling procedure as in the control approach, uh, a last step uh, then consisted in uh, resampling the model to the new target update rate. Um, one um, uh, contribution of this work is actually hidden in this first uh, step because the uh, formulation of a closed analytical uh, set of uh, differential equations uh, is not a trivial task because of the uh, two active bridges on either side of the transformer. So I made use of a disc uh, discretized park transformation um, to uh, get a closed formulation. But this can be read in the thesis document. Um, instead, uh, I would like to move on directly to the system dynamics that we can now analyze uh, in the pole zero map, as we can see it here, uh, with the open loop poles indicated by crosses and uh, an open loop zero here on the left. These uh, pole and zero locations uh, have been derived by linearizing the nonlinear uh, model of the DAB3. Uh, you can see here the linearization around the idle state. And if we now uh, uh, check how these uh, locations change, if we linearize around different operating points ranging up to the full load operation, then we can actually see, well, sorry, I think it doesn't respond anymore. Charging. Nope, this is a little bit too fast. So let's try it again. Yeah. Now we can see uh, the effect. Actually, the uh, the open loop zero on the left side migrates further to the left as we um, uh, move to full load operation and linearize around this operating point. Uh, whereas the open loop poles remain fixed in their positions. So uh, to have, have it one, all in one uh, picture, we can visualize it in this way. And um, now uh, in order to interpret these uh, pole and zero locations, I would like to revis revisit some, um, yeah, uh, some, some basics about how to, how to read this, this plot. Uh, in the origin, we have deadbeat behavior. So uh, this is the fastest that we can get. Within one step, we reach a new steady state trajectory. Uh, then in the left half plane, we can expect forced oscillations. Um, if the pole locations are outside this unit circle, then uh, uh, we will even have uh, instability. And uh, this means that the well-behaved pole locations are somewhere in the right half plane within the unit circle. So. Um, uh, this having said, uh, we can interpret these poles on the right side. This is still in the uh, well-behaved region, and it's quite a special uh, pole location because it shows us uh, integral behavior of the related state variable. 
uh, on the left side, this uh, poll, uh, however, uh, actually shows very undesirable dynamics since uh, it uh, creates forced oscillations. We have already seen uh, with the abrupt load step that um, uh, if we uh, just do nothing but just change uh, the uh, load angle uh, from now to, uh, well, within, within one step abruptly, then uh, we see these oscillations. Um, but we have also directly seen a solution. Now it's taking some time again. Yeah, bandwidth. Hold on a second. I can just try to be optimistic and just uh, keep on talking a little bit what we will see. Uh, so ah, there it is. Uh, we have already seen the uh, solution, uh, actually the IICC. Uh, as it turns out, uh, as we can now interpret it, uh, its effect on the pole and zero locations, it shifts this undesirable pole into the origin and gives it very desirable, uh, which is dead be uh, behavior. Um, and one la last word. Well, so uh, altogether, uh, the DAB3, including ICC, uh, gives us this picture. And one last word about the uh, zero locations, since they are outside of the unit circle. Um, this indicates that we have non-minimum phase characteristics uh, because uh, the phase, uh, the plant is not invertible since otherwise these uh, zeros would become poles and lie within the instable region. So uh, how does uh, this model perform uh, in order to evaluate this? I compared it to a circuit simulation um, with a variable step solver. And you can see on the left side here, uh, um, by the red curve, uh, my discrete time model, which samples very well the uh, circ the continuous circuit uh, simulation, which is shown in blue. Uh, and uh, if we check the model error or the deviation between these two, uh, just read the, the right axis here, model error in per million, uh, it is pretty much insignificant. Uh, so uh, we have uh, effectively reached a, a very high accuracy and can confidently use this model in the next step. However, uh, I would first like to um, uh, emphasize some contributions. In this first step, um, uh, I derived a physics-based model for DAB3 uh, dynamics, which includes both current and voltage dynamics with higher accuracy, as opposed to uh, existing models that basically uh, approximate the, the uh, current dynamics so far. Uh, the model also contains the digital latch um, uh, coming from the uh, microcontroller interface and even captures uh, resonance effects between the DC link capacitor and the AC link uh, leakage inductances. Uh, the model allowed to identify all system poles and zeros, uh, including the effect of the ICC, so that we can uh, have a solid basis for control uh, design. So um, based on this, let's move on to the linear control synthesis. Um, I try to visualize uh, my control concept uh, with this picture. Uh, we have this truck in, uh, on the left side uh, driving away a big load of dirt uh, and this man with a shovel in the back, which is obviously much slower and cannot take as high a burden as the truck. And uh, this man is actually supposed to represent the feedback controller since uh, the feedback controller has also a sluggish response and suffers from uh, inherent phase lag. Uh, so we have an interest of uh, minimizing its effect on the overall system response, uh, which means that the lion's share of the control task uh, should be taken over by the model-based control uh, elements that have uh, higher dynamics. Uh, so by making extensive use of model knowledge, we can actually minimize the delays from the uh, lagging feedback controller. Um, for uh, predictable response characteristics, especially, especially in the uh, disturbance rejection behavior, I made use of linear control theory for this step. So how does this translate into the control architecture? Let's uh, develop the uh, block diagram piece by piece together. 
uh, starting with a physical plant uh, of the DAB3 and the latched interface of the microcontroller. Uh, as a first element, I introduced the IIFCC that we have uh, discussed uh, before, which um, shifts this undesirable pole location into the origin, uh, giving it deadbeat behavior. This block receives at its input a load angle reference, um, which is calculated within the trajectory generator as a command feed forward signal DCFF. And uh, both of these blocks, IIFCC and the trajectory generator, are model-based uh, controllers that work in an open loop fashion. Uh, and obviously, we will always have uh, some sort of disturbances that we cannot predict by models. So um, I introduced a feedback controller uh, to uh, deal with these unpredictable disturbances. However, there are a few disturbances that we can actually measure or predict. So uh, we have an interest in uh, decoupling uh, those disturbances as well in order to take away as much work from the, mic uh, from the feedback controller as we can. Uh, now, if you recall the image, um, we have these three uh, uh, model-based uh, control elements that really drive away the big dirt and the feedback controller is supposed to just deal with the residuals. So um, let's uh, have a closer look at the trajectory generator since it um, is a, a key element in this control scheme as it assumes a coordinating role. Um, therefore, uh, we can first check the, have a look at the um, uh, individual elements of the trajectory generator. We have a model of the DAB3 converter here and of the IICC, um, uh, which form together the reference plant model. Uh, then we have an actuator saturation model, which um, uh, reflects the operating limits of the DAB3. And uh, last but not least, we have this tuning gain, which allows us to uh, tune this uh, feedback loop here. So how does this work? Uh, let's assume that we have a, a step input command here uh, at the input v to ref. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, no physical system can follow a step command uh, perfectly. So what the actuator saturation model then does is uh, that it uh, crops the infeasible part of the uh, dynamics and clamps the um, uh, load angle DCFF to the maximum feasible value. Uh, which is then forwarded, if you can see here below, uh, to, directly to the physical plant. But it is also uh, communicated to the uh, model of the plant. So this means, uh, and the model uh, output um, uh, meets the measured voltage here at the summing point. And if we have done a very good job on the uh, plant modeling, then uh, actually this, uh, feasible, this calculated feasible reference trajectory uh, will be exactly equal to the measured voltage at the physical plant. This means that the, uh, that the feedback controller doesn't see, uh, see any um, uh, voltage deviation at its input anymore and is effectively decoupled from the command response. So uh, in this way, we can um, individually tune the feedback controller for maximum robustness and a predictable response, and uh, the command feed forward controller for maximum dynamics. I have tested the proper functioning uh, of this control scheme on a, a hardware prototype. You can see here the command step uh, scenario. On the left side, you see the um, uh, voltage trajectory uh, without a trajectory generator uh, in the red curve here, uh, showing ver a very sluggish behavior and um, being, well, it is uh, obviously dominated by the feedback controller. And if you compare it with the waveform uh, or with the curve in um, purple color, which uh, activated the trajectory generator, you can see that it actually uh, gets uh, pretty much of a ramp um, characteristic, uh, which has a very much higher um, uh, dynamic than the sluggish response of the without trajectory generator. On the right side, we see the voltage deviation as seen by the feedback controller. Uh, in blue color, you see, uh, again, the scenario without trajectory generator. And when we activate the trajectory generator, we can actually see uh, by the red curve that uh, it stays uh, uh, at zero all the time. So the decoupling uh, from the command uh, response or the command 
yeah, from the command response has uh, been successfully achieved. Uh, I also investigated the load step scenario uh, for a load step of uh, one kilowatt, uh, as you can see in the plot above. And uh, in the lower plot, um, you see the resulting uh, voltage waveforms on the primary side and on the secondary side. And as you can see, the commercial voltage source um, uh, on the primary side has a uh, big trouble uh, keeping the voltage stable, whereas the secondary side, um, which is um, stabilized uh, by the DAB3 using my control scheme, uh, doesn't actually seem to notice anything. So um, it uh, uh, successfully stabilizes the voltage and uh, seems to work quite well. Uh, this lead, leads me to my contributions in this second step of my dissertation. Um, I uh, developed a control uh, or I optimized a control. Um, I developed an optimized control design, which combines uh, maximum uh, dynamics with uh, predictable disturbance rejection characteristics and uh, which unlocks uh, the full dynamics uh, potential of the DAB3. And by giving uh, precise tuning recommendations for each control element, it can be uh, actually used in a plug and play manner um, and therefore uh, yeah, fulfills the general purpose um, goal. Now let's move on to the fourth part, uh, to the fourth chapter, the third part of my dissertation, uh, the adaptive compensation of parameter deviations. Um, where I uh, will only present the case for uh, symmetrical um, deviations in the uh, tolerances in the magnetic materials. Uh, this leakage inductance may de deviate from the nominal design value. And this has a direct impact on the controller performance. Um, as we can see in the plots on the right side, in the upper plot, uh, you see the scenario for an under underestimation of the leakage inductance, uh, which means that it is, it is actually higher than the assumed nominal design value. And uh, as you can see, uh, the measured voltage is actually shown here in red. Um, is again dominated by the uh, feedback controller since it, since it is much um, slower than it could be. The ideal waveform is shown here in gray. Um, in the other scenario of an overestimation, which means that the leakage inductance is lower than the uh, assumed nominal value, um, we have uh, uh, we get the picture as shown here below where uh, the trajectory generator actually issues an overly conservative um, command re uh, request, uh, and um, therefore uh, we have an interest in restoring the maximum uh, performance, and this requires a, a controller recalibration. This recalibration uh, can be achieved by a model reference adaptive control scheme, uh, whose idea is to basically um, define a reference model and give it uh, the desired uh, dynamics and then use an adaptive law to force these dynamics upon the controlled physical process, as you can see here. So um, now the question is, uh, well, this is the theory. How can we apply this to uh, uh, the given control scheme uh, for the DAB3 converter? Uh, here you can see a reduced uh, form of it where you have the uh, trajectory generator on the left side here with a command feed forward load angle um, and the feedback controller uh, uh, on the or the feedback control loop on the right side. Um, in order to apply this MREC scheme to the DAB3 uh, to the control DAB3, it is um, useful to recall the adaptation objectives. What do we want to achieve? Actually, uh, we will de we definitely want to restore the maximum uh, controller dynamics as we had them uh, in the nominal case. Uh, however, we also would like to preserve the predictable disturbance uh, rejection characteristics because uh, the MREC scheme is a nonlinear control scheme. And um, uh, this means that uh, the um, uh, transient response between two steady states uh, are hard to predict. So we might want to keep it away from this feedback loop. Um, 
Luckily, uh, we have this uh, yeah, uh, control scheme with the trajectory generator, where the trajectory generator actually acts as a pre-filter uh, for the uh, following control elements. Um, so uh, we can safely adapt the model within the trajectory generator in order to restore perfect decoupling. Um, and uh, yeah, in my thesis, I also investigated the effect of noise and uh, switching dead time on the convergence uh, behavior of the MREX scheme and uh, introduced some minor uh, adjustments, as you can see here. And uh, yeah, this is the final control scheme for the MREC part. Um, in order to uh, uh, check the performance of this control scheme, uh, I simulated um, an underestimation scenario under realistic operating conditions, including measurement noise, switching dead time, and a persistent excitation by a non-zero load current. And as you can see here below, uh, we start with a wrongly estimated leakage inductance of 32 microhenry, whereas uh, the true value is actually at 40 microhenry. And uh, as we have seen before, uh, we get this uh, sluggish response in the red uh, curve and the red voltage uh, that we can measure at the plant output. And if we now activate the, the uh, MREC scheme, we can see that uh, the, um, uh, the uh, leakage inductance estimate uh, converges to the true uh, leakage inductance value and uh, as it does so, the control performance is gradually improved until uh, the red curve is actually uh, just coincides with uh, the desired gray curve. I also tested this on a hardware prototype for different um, uh, initial uh, assumptions on the leakage inductance, ranging from, uh, well, in this case, 35 uh, microhenries to we are, what is this, uh, 52 or 53 microhenries um, with uh, the true value being here in the middle. And all of these scenarios uh, successfully converge to the true value. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't uh, record all of these, so uh, uh, you must believe me that they actually met the true value. <laughs> Uh, so this leads me to my contributions in this third step uh, of um, uh, the compensation of leakage inductance scattering. Um, the, uh, uh, I um, implemented a, rec a control recalibration um, approach uh, which operates at runtime and recovers the maximum uh, control performance using an MREC scheme. Um, it uh, allows uh, or it it preserves the predictability of the disturbance rejection uh, characteristics. And in order to uh, being sure that it is uh, safe to use, I um, uh, conducted a proof of convergence and stability using the Lyapunov theorem. Um, and by using this uh, algorithm, we can actually um, yeah, restore the, the control performance without uh, heavy need of uh, re-engineering. Um, in a second part, which I didn't show in this um, presentation in the interest of time, um, uh, I also um, implemented or developed a, a compensation uh, approach for phase asymmetries, a, uh, which balances uh, the RMS currents on each phase in order to uh, get the maximum thermal utilization of the transformer. This is an extension of a method that has been introduced a couple of years ago at this uh, institute as well, um, where actually the um, uh, the phase currents, missing the word, the instantane, oh, sorry. No, no, not, uh, never mind. This is an extension of the, uh, of, of, an, of an existing, uh, uh, approach that has been implemented at this institute as well. You can read it in the uh, document that I record the word. So um, to frame it in one word, uh, I uh, restored the maximum control uh, performance and uh, guaranteed uh, maximum transformer utilization by means of these uh, approaches that successfully compensate for parameter deviations in the leakage inductance. So um, this brings me to my conclusion. Um, I developed a discrete time model for DAB3 dynamics, uh, which uh, models both 
the uh, current dynamics and voltage dynamics with excellent accuracy and allows for a consistent interpretation of uh, the system dynamics in, the, uh, in terms of poles and zeros. Um, and uh, I, yeah, in order to apply it to the DAB3, I included the effects of the ICC to interpret them in terms of the pole and zero uh, locations. Um, this uh, model was then used in a second step to derive a control framework, which is optimized for uh, maximum dynamics and um, predictable and robust uh, disturbance rejection. And by, um, uh, by giving uh, precise tuning recommendations for each control element, it, act it is actually usable in a plug and play manner. In the third step, I um, introduced uh, uh, two approaches to compensate uh, leakage inductance scattering effects. Uh, uh, on the one hand, uh, for symmetrical deviations of the effective leakage inductance, a MREC uh, approach, which uh, recalibrates uh, the trajectory generator at runtime and uh, avoids the need for excessive re-engineering. And uh, on the other hand, a RMS phase current balancing approach that um, uh, yeah, basically um, makes sure that in the presence of phase asymmetries in the leakage inductance, we can still use the uh, transformer at the thermal maximum. Um, so altogether, I uh, optimized a control strategy for this uh, plug and play uh, use case scenario um, and uh, yeah, open it up for realistic uh, operating scenarios, including um, non-idealities like these parameter scattering effects. Uh, what might be future um, uh, interesting points to uh, uh, look at, um, we might think about extending this model used in the uh, trajectory generator, um, especially with respect to switching dead time, which has uh, not been considered so far. Uh, so by doing so, uh, we could further reduce uh, the work amount of the feedback controller, but more importantly, uh, we would definitely um, improve the convergence behavior of the nonlinear MREC control approach. Um, so this would be, uh, 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 yeah, probably with respect to the other approaches, more low-hanging fruit. Um, uh, we could also add uh, alternative modulation strategies to the picture in order to consistently switch between modulation strategies within one control approach. Um, if we move from um, full load operation to partial load operation, for instance, um, then with respect to the balancing uh, approach, we might uh, think about um, uh, yeah, developing uh, a balancing of asymmetrical magnetizing inductances as well in order to uh, avoid saturation effects and uh, utilize the transformer at the uh, magnetic maximum as well. Uh, and um, yeah, uh, definitely large piece of work would be an extension to multi-port active bridges, as you can see here on the right side, uh, as an example, the three-port uh, dual active bridge, uh, uh, the three-port active bridge. Um, this uh, would definitely be interesting especially uh, if you think about the balancing uh, of uh, phase asymmetries, since uh, in this uh, multi-port scenario, the um, power transfer is actually directly related to the ratios of the individual phase uh, uh, inductances. So uh, this might be a very interesting point as well. But um, I guess uh, this is for future generations. 